they paid too much money to watch this fool on stage. Uh, you just did a, uh, it was the uh, the challenge. What was it? What, what, tell me about it. What was it? I forgot. You told me about it. It was like the magicians where it was a battle, battle of magicians. Yes, we did. It was called um, Magic Smackdown. Uh, <laughs> it was created by Simon Cornell uh, and Nick Paul. And they basically have three magicians and then they do uh, different like improv games uh, while doing magic. Uh, as challenges, and then the audience live votes. Uh, Simon Cornell is a programmer, so we programmed this uh, website where the audience goes to at the beginning of the show, and they live vote for who they liked per round. And wow. at the end, he crowned somebody, you know, the champion. And how'd you do? Uh, we did three nights. I won two of the three. Oh, all right. What's interesting to me is like how vast. Like, I guess we don't realize it as magicians, but like. The audience will like something more, just just certain audiences. So like there was one round where we got to do our own trick at the end that had no like game within it. Right. The first night I had the most votes, Simon had the second amount of votes, and Nick Paul had the least amount of votes. And then the next day, Nick Paul had the most votes, Simon had the middle votes, and I had the least amount of votes on that trick. So but I'm, are you doing the same games every night? We're doing the same games every night and we're doing the same tricks every night. So our show is the same, but because it's an improv game, we're getting suggestions and stuff. It's very important. Oh, um, but, but that's what I was very interested by was the last yeah. thing was just our own trick. And I got the most votes one night and Nick Paul got the most votes the other night. But I had the lead, like, it was yeah. so weird. Well, that well, it's the audience. It's that, you know, it's subjective. Like, you know, yeah. every, every audience is going to like different things based off of who makes up and comprises that audience, right? Right. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, it's funny because there's this, um, you know, this, you, you've heard this a million times. There's a saying where, you know, there's no such thing as a bad audience, right? And if yeah. it's a bad audience, it's actually the performer, not the audience. And you know yeah. what? That's not true. <laughs> like, there can be bad audiences. But as a performer, it's your job to turn them into a good audience, right? Like, yeah. it's your job to be able to adapt and realize, oh, wait, these, these guys are a little bit different. Like, I did that in my show, and I still do that to, in my show, um, even when I was in the casinos, always, because I was in complete control, and it's my crew, and in and, and theaters, it's my crew. So I, they know the show, so I'll switch it up mid-show, and I'll say, hey, look, we're doing this. Or I go into an intro of something and the guy backstage is like, oh, okay, now this prop and, and, and the tech in the booth is like, oh, here, we're going here. On the cruises, I have, because not my crew, I have certain spots where I might swap things in and out. Yeah, and, yeah. But, but less frequently because the crew doesn't know the show as well. But, you know, and Lance Burton used to do that. He would go out in the show and then after like the first few minutes, he would, as he went backstage for a change, he would like say, oh, we're doing this tonight. Oh, we're doing this tonight. And I think that's really helpful because, you know, not every audience is going to be the same and react to the same thing. So if you see an yeah. audience it's going to be a little bit more, you know, cerebral and intellectual, you might go into a trick that's less comedy and more kind of puzzling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Doug Henning did something similar, but it wasn't <laughs> if the audience was, like, bad or whatever. Have you not heard this since Jim ever told you the story? I think so. He had a yellow bag stage left. And oh, all right. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, what's okay? So I know it's the silk. There's a uh, he did a torn and start silk in one, and I don't remember what was in the other one. I think it was the uh, uh, a cut and store rope. Yes, a hundred percent. I think it was the, the the knife. Yes, it was because he was also saying that he used to do uh, the silk where you cut the silk in half and then pull and it was back together. Right, like and you also cut the silk and, every time. And and also um, what that was for was an emergency trick so if something went wrong right. backstage the assistant would just walk on stage with whatever color bag oh. based off the color of the bag he knew what routine to go into and what intro and i believe they were different lengths Ooh. So like, for example let's say the yellow bag was the silk he knew that was like a two minute routine where they just need something real quick they just need a little bit more time whereas like the other one might be a green bag and that was like a five minute routine so it's like all right we really have to do something different. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So getting into it, uh, go. It was going to be amazing. Man, I was trying to think about this. The first one that came to my head was when I was just in Pittsburgh doing uh, Liberty Magic. 
And I was doing a trick called Awful Words that's in Impuzzibilities. That's a variation of Jim Steinmeier's uh, cue card mentalism. Cue card mentalism. So it says like hooray and, and cheer and stuff. And then the audience picks one and it ends up on that. But bad wor- Awful Words is one where they're all words that look like bad words because they're censored. But when I tell you what the word is, it's not. So it, uh, so it says like, like um, what's a good one? Like B hyphen, 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 H. Yeah. Uh, but it, the word is blush. So we used to call the boss's wife this blush because she used to get red in the face. <laughs> the routine that I've done for years, I've, I have like markers on the cue cards to know what order they have to be in. Okay. Like, I, like, I double check this thing. I know I can't fail at this thing because I have literally a built in safety for me. Okay. And I'm just doing the show. Uh, we did 35 shows. We did uh, five shows a week for six weeks. Um, so I'm just I'm plowing through it because I know this, this routine. And I get to the cue card and I say, you know, sir, name anyone. He names the one. I go, great. We're going to spell that word using one letter per thing to make it random. That way I didn't know what you're going to choose. You didn't know what you're going to choose. And I started doing it. And I spelled a word and I look at the back of it and I notice it's the wrong one. <laughs> so then I look at the front and I notice it's the wrong one. And there was this moment in my head that I thought, this is also the second trick in my show. <laughs> and I thought in my head, I was like, well, do I attempt to save this by making up some reason and then like putting them in the order they need to be? Or do I just quit right now? <laughs> quit. I can just quit this and like, I can just walk away from this and no one will care. Right? Or do I save this? Like, it's the second trick. Like, how much do I need to get? How fast are these people going to turn on me <laughs> in the second trick? So, at, like, it happened like a millisecond. And then I just kind of went, ladies and gentlemen, I've done this trick for three <laughs> years. Three years. It's, it's an amazing trick. And uh, I didn't do it right. So, <laughs> and you could tell, like, the audience kind of chuckled, but didn't laugh, laugh until I really threw the cards away and I literally took out the next thing and went, all right, great. Uh, Fred Capps invented this trick using five <laughs> red cards. And they just, then they just started laughing. And I was like, guys, we're moving on. Like, we're just moving Let on. Let it go. Yeah, you just accept it. We're going to move on. And so then I started um, Fred Capps' homing card, which is another trick that I fail. <laughs> And I didn't realize it until I had gotten to the, and I was like, oh no, now this audience thinks <laughs> this, is, I, this is the show. This is it. I'm just bad that I'm going to have to, I'm going to, they, they're going to, they're thinking I'm going to have to stop this trick as well and move on to the next one. I haven't, I'm not deep enough into the show where they can think this is a running bit. This is just now <laughs> they paid too much money to watch this fool on stage. <laughs> So wait, so what happened on that one? What did you did you finish? No, I, did you go throw it on the ground? No. So homing card. Uh, wait, you should have done say, ladies and gentlemen, I've been doing this trick for five. Years. <laughs> I didn't. Every I was, time it goes up farther and farther. I just was so panicked. It was the first time in a magic show that I really was like, oh no, like <laughs> I'm like I'm literally digging my hole deeper, and I'm not trying to. So I just did the routine as normal. And when I got to the end and it all worked out where the last one turned uh, black, the, the, the black card comes back, I throw them away and I go to the next one and I just looked at the audience and I went, that one's supposed to happen like that. <laughs> and then I just moved on and I just did it. And it was fine. And, and uh, after the show, we, did a, we do a VIP. Um, there's like the front row gets like a VIP uh, talk back after the show. And so one of the questions immediately was, you know, is that, how that, is that what's supposed to happen? I was like, no, absolutely <laughs> not. You think I wasted your time for four minutes to get to that moment and just be like, well, I guess not. There's four minutes gone. So um, that's hilarious because people think, and I mean, they have no idea. And they're like, oh, is that, I think that's supposed to happen now. So yesterday, um, when I talked with Kevin, his story was about an underwater escape. And I, when I first got my underwater escape, I... I knew that I wanted something dangerous, but I knew it was also going to be a publicity piece that I could do to promote the show as I'm coming to these different cities, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> we, 
about maybe a week before, maybe two weeks before this particular theater show, um, I went out with the tank and we scheduled this media kind of day. And it was like this, you know, the, the local radio station was going to be there, do a live radio from me doing the water escape. We invited reporters and there's photographers and a few people, but there was probably about an audience, about 30 people. And we were outside the theater. Yeah. And it's the first time, well, second time, because the first time I did it was in Tahoe, but the second time I had ever done this. And we fill the tank with water and you see the venue behind us and it's staged here and everybody's there. And I'm kind of like, okay, here we go, ready to go. And the, and the, and the presenter was like, text me like literally right before this is about to happen. She was like, I'm not going to need to like bust open this lock, right? And I was like, no, I'm fine. It was, <laughs> it was gonna be amazing. And then um, I, I was locked inside. So how it goes is I get inside the, wa in the water, the, I have holes in the lid, my hands go through the holes in the lid, my hand, hands are handcuffed on the outside and then the lid is locked shut. So I'm underwater like this. Well, I pick the cuffs and with, with a ring and I do the pick, I get the cuffs off, boom. Then I have to pick the lock for the, to open the lid. Yeah. And I go in for my pick, cause I carry it on my ankle. I go in for my pick. And as I'm going up through the holes, I go to grab the lock and I drop the pick on the outside of the tank. And I'm like, oh man. And like in my head, I'm locked under water. Okay, holding my breath. And in my head, I'm thinking, Oh no, <laughs> do <laughs> so. I'm like, uh, so I go, you know what? I'm smart, I have a safety, I have a backup pick. Okay, always have backups. Well, what happened was, is when I went for that other pick, I dropped it on the bottom, in the tank at least, but on okay. the bottom. But I'm holding my breath and I kind of put my hand on the ground, kind of trying to feel for it. I know I'm gonna have to open my eyes and find this. And the more it the longer it takes, the more stress, my breath, my heart's pumping. Like, again, this is also something very new. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> like as I'm holding my breath, like the thoughts that are going through your head. So what ends up happening is I go, you know what? It's not worth it. And I just gave my signal and Megan opened the lock. She, I gave a signal, she goes over there, she unlocks the lock, she lifts the lid, I get out and I'm like, <sighs> and I'm just having my head down like, I'm dripping wet and I'm still standing in there but I can breathe and I'm like, and I look up and I see everybody just really confused. <laughs> so, Cause I kind of just went underwater and then she let me out. And I just said, uh, I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> it's like something's happened that's never happened before. I dropped a pick on the outside and then my backup pick I dropped there. So I was really locked underwater and I could not get out. So I decided that uh, to give me, I gave Megan the signal, she let me out and um, we're gonna do it again. And as soon as I said that, everybody goes, oh, oh, because now they're freaking out. They're like, oh my gosh, so I go, oh, we're gonna do it well, again. Now they see the danger. Oh yeah, but see, that's what, you know, that's what Houdini did, right? So what happened was is, I go back and I said, I'm gonna do it again. And they're like, no, no, are you serious? I go, well, I have to because it's a mental game because if I let this beat me, I'll never be able to do it again. Like I yeah. have to do this. Otherwise I'm gonna get stuck, right? So I go and I do it again, I get out and I get out. Everybody goes, yeah, like crazy. And again, there's only like 30 people but the radios, they're talking on the radio, like the newspaper, they're taking photos. And, and like at the end of it, Megan's there and people are going up to her and like, Is that part of the show? It's, does he do that every time? And Megan's like, no. She goes, I was so freaked out. I'm like, I'm locking this going like, don't drop the key as I'm unlocking. But like, they had no idea. And people thought that I did it on purpose. Yeah. And, that, and you know, I mean, I mean, I thought about doing it on purpose, but I yeah. wouldn't do that on purpose because like, <laughs> I don't want to do that. Uh, yeah, it, 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 we made the front paper. We made the front page. We made the front Every page. position succeeds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's always nice when you when you actually do the trick you're trying. You're to supposed do. to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, see, I couldn't have started over my trick, <laughs> but I debated. I debated how to get out of it. 